Okay, we're in the 21st chapter of the Gospel by John, uh, what many consider to be the epilogue of the Gospel, the epilogue of the Gospel of John, and also uh, the final sign, uh, an eighth sign is given to us in this chapter. So we're going to read the first 17 verses. And just for a, a shorter title, I just want to put one word, and that's restoration, because I do believe that that's what this chapter really is about, the Lord restoring his disciples to service. And so beginning in verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? They, they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciple came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with fishes. And soon... As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all that were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this morning. Now, I want to just begin with this idea that there are those that believe that this chapter shouldn't be there. Uh, the learned higher critics, so-called, uh, they believe that the climax of the book really should be chapter 20 and uh, the great confession of Thomas, and then uh, the purpose of reaching, writing the book in verse 30 and 31, uh, that you might believe and that believing you might have life through his name. And so they say, well, it must be some uh, ad addition by some other author, although uh, certainly the vocabulary, the language would indicate it's the same author uh, all the way through. And I do believe it's a fitting epilogue. And I believe it's uh, just as John began his gospel with a prologue, uh, where we began in chapter one, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. It also has a fitting epilogue. And why is this epilogue necessary? Let me tell you the reasons why. Two reasons. I think that this chapter is very essential. One is it validates Peter's ministry, which would have been questioned by many 
if there had not been a public restoration of the Lord to ministry. Uh, we'd have been left with the, with the question is, should this man be serving? Uh, didn't he deny the Lord with oaths and curses and all this kind of thing? And, and so uh, it eliminates any doubt as to the validity of the ministry of Peter, which is going to be so prominent in the first 12 chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. And so John wants us to know something. He wants us to know that Peter not only was privately restored by the Lord in that meeting that we don't know anything about other than that it's mentioned several times, but that he also was publicly restored in the presence of the other disciples to service. And so uh, very important. The second reason that this chapter is important too is that there was a, a misunderstanding that was circulating in the early church that was basically saying that John, the apostle, would not see death until Christ returned. And he wants to correct that misunderstanding. And uh, in the section we're going to be looking at today, that's not found, but in verse 18 onwards, uh, we're going to see that that misunderstanding is going to be corrected. And so that's going to eliminate anybody wondering, well, uh, I thought the Lord said that John would be alive when the Lord returned and John's dead and the Lord didn't come back. And so is, is this all really true? And so it was very essential uh, that this should be written, this fitting epilogue. And of course, there's a final sign. Now, we saw that the previous signs were, were carefully selected by John to convince the reader without a shadow of doubt that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And we saw that in chapter 20 and verse uh, 30 and 31. But here we have an eighth sign, uh, the miracle, I guess, of the Lord knowing the location of the 153 fish and in, uh, carpenter instructing fishermen how to catch fish. And uh, it's, it's interesting that it's the eighth sign in the Gospel of John, and eight is the number of resurrection. And this sign is not given so that people might believe. It's actually given to people who already believe. And so it has a different purpose. It's designed specifically for the disciples to teach them a lesson. Ones that already had believed that he was the Christ, the son of the living God, already had life through his name. Uh, this is a sign, a miracle performed by the risen Christ for their benefit, for their instruction. And very important instruction it is for them. We mentioned that the major background, really, of this chapter is the public restoration of Peter before his fellow disciples. He'd already been restored to personal fellowship by the Lord in a private meeting, which we're not told any details other than it occurred. And I want to, again, just reiterate, I think we looked at this last time, but just to see that there was this private meeting with Peter, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark's gospel to begin with chapter 16 and verse 7. Uh, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. Uh, and then <clears throat> Luke 24 Luke 24 and verse 34, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And then the final one that we have is in 1 Corinthians and chapter 15 and verse 5, where we read about this one where we're not given any details. It was a very private meeting between the Lord and Peter. Then he was seen of Cephas then of the 12, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. And it would seem that in that private meeting, uh, there was a, a restoration of fellowship uh, between Peter and the Lord, but not a restoration to service and to ministry and not a public restoration. And that's what we find in chapter 21. 
Now, it's not just Peter that's in view. I believe the other disciples are also in view here. They're, they're listening to this conversation. Uh, they're party to it. And they also have failed the Lord, maybe not quite as vocally as Peter, but every one of them had let the Lord down. And if you look back to John 16 and verse 32, uh, John 16, verse 32, we read about this, that each one had failed the Lord. John 16, 32, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. You, you shall be scattered, every man to his own. And we, we know they all forsook him and fled. And so it, it has them all in view, not just Peter, although Peter certainly is the, the kind of center of attention here in this particular section. So the setting uh, of this restoration is at the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, that's a term that uh, John alone uses, again, because he's writing later and the name has been changed. Uh, it's the Sea of Galilee that we often know it of, or uh, also uh, the Lake Gennesaret. It's sometimes termed, uh, but uh, they've left the hostile environment of Jerusalem and Judea, and they've gone back to the familiar territory of Galilee. And part of the reason they've gone back is the Lord had said that he would meet them with them in Galilee. And let's just look at that uh, instructions that he had given to them to, to go to Galilee and meet with him there out of that hostile environment of the capital city of Jerusalem. And so Matthew 28, for instance, verse seven, it says, go quickly, tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Verse 10, then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. And so he, he had told them, go to Galilee and I'll meet with you there. And they had gone exactly as he'd instructed. They'd gone up to Galilee. It tells us uh, in verse two that there are seven of the disciples together at this particular appearance of the Lord Jesus. Five of them are named. Uh, two of them are left unnamed. So we've got Simon Peter. Thomas is with them this time, called Didymus. Uh, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, we remember him from chapter one, and then the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and then it says, and two other of his disciples. Now, we're not told why. He doesn't tell us who they are. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to who they are. Some Many believe uh, that it would be Andrew and Philip, uh, and that would complete kind of the original inner core of his disciples, the first disciples that he had called, and now he is back in Galilee meeting with them once again. And so that is the general thought, uh, although, again, we can't be dogmatic when Scripture is silent. <laughs> Usually there's a reason, uh, but there's two others. So there's, there's, uh, there's this uh, group of seven of them, and once again we see Peter uh, taking the lead in verse 3. Simon Peter says to them, I go a fishing. And they <laughs> say unto him, we also go with thee. And certainly there's no doubt Peter was a, was a leader of men. He, he, was, uh, he had people's attention. People followed him. They followed uh, his direction. And so although Peter's back in fellowship with the Lord after this private meeting for restoration, perhaps he thinks he could never be used of the Lord in a public sphere again, because of his failure. So what does he do? He goes back to what he knows best. He's a fisherman. That's what he knows. And sometimes during periods of great mental distress, doing something physical and familiar can be better than just hanging around and moping uh, and uh, being concerned. Uh, I remember one time uh, many years ago, we were going through a great, uh, great trial in the local church that I was part of. And the stress levels of church uh, divisions are intense. They're just horrendous. Uh, nobody would wish them on anybody. 
And uh, in the midst of all that, uh, I took a particular delight in weeding a garden. Now, I want to tell you, that's not my normal preference, but it was just doing something physical that took me away from the problems. And I, I found great relief, actually, in just pulling weeds. I found it something quite remarkable. And so, uh, and again, I think there's part of this. Uh, they're, they've gone through a tremendous uh, time of turmoil over the uh, the previous days. And so they go and do something physical, uh, something just to, as it were, get their minds away, maybe go back to something familiar. We also notice, uh, again, why we know that this is so clearly uh, John writing, because John often shows us in his writing that Peter was a man of action. Uh, he's impulsive in character. And John generally is more contemplative uh, more of a thinker. Peter does, uh, John thinks, he mulls over things. And of course, isn't it wonderful uh, that the Lord uses in his service all different types of personalities. He uses the contemplative, the, the thinker. He uses the impulsive, let's get it done, type people. And so <clears throat> the the great, interesting too, isn't it, that the greater number of the disciples the Lord chose were fishermen. If you look at the overall picture, the greatest number were fishermen. Uh, if all these represent that, that's seven out of 12. So that's, a, that's more than half. And it, it is uh, interesting. Why would he pick fishermen? I, I think part of it is fishermen knew, know a lot about perseverance. That's one thing about them. They're, they're, they're men who persevere. And they also know about... Uh, calm seas, and they know about stormy seas. Uh, and certainly following the Lord Jesus is like that, isn't it? There are times of great calmness. Everything seems to be going well, and there's times of great turmoil. And these individuals, they kind of knew that. They, they, got, they were used to that kind of life. Uh, they knew what it was to go through choppy waters and certainly they would go through that in the days ahead, following the Lord Jesus. They would experience those things. And so he picks these men. And so they went fishing. And so it says they went forth, entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. It wasn't a successful return to what they knew best. Uh, they knew the Sea of Galilee. They knew it well. Uh, they knew their profession. They knew their trade. They were good fishermen. And yet they labored all night and they caught nothing. Despite fishing at the right time, despite doing it with the right people in the right equipment and in the right place, it was a fruitless exercise. I wonder, was the Lord trying to teach them a vital message in this? Remember he had said to them, on the night that he was betrayed, he said this, without me, you can do nothing. And he's burning that lesson home to them. Even what they thought they could do well, what they were confident about, what they were familiar with, what they were, and he's showing them, you can't do, you can't even do that without me. You need me in every aspect of your life. And so it says in verse four, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Again, we see him, uh, this great ability, uh, perhaps because it's early morning maybe, but I think there's something more here. There's this, uh, this pattern that we've observed uh, that he's able to withhold him, his identity uh, from his disciples as he did uh, to Mary Magdalene, had, as he did to the two on the road to Emmaus, until just the right moment for maximum effect, he's able to reveal himself. And so he does this once again. And so this stranger on the shore, as it were, uh, disciples didn't know who it was. Verse five, then Jesus says to them, children, have you any meat? Kind of nice term that he uses. He didn't say failures. <laughs> He doesn't say, you guys that let me down, he calls them children or lads. <laughs> kind of nice. It's a nice term. Do you have any 
Do you have any food? Do you have any meat? And of course, for fishermen, they hate to be asked that question, especially good fishermen who know their trade, right? They've been at it all night. You get any fish? They usually would like to answer with, well, we had a few nibbles at the very least, right? But what do they say? No. <laughs> no, we didn't. It was a miserable failure. Not a thing. Not a bite. Not a nibble. Nothing. All night long, and we caught nothing. And then this stranger calls out instructions to expert fishermen. And he tells them that they should cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. It's amazing really to think that they, they took instructions from this stranger. Maybe they thought that he could see something they couldn't see. Uh, maybe he saw evidence of a shoal of fish or something like that. Anyway, they, they, they do. They, they follow his instructions and they caught a wonderful catch. It's interesting that the difference between success and failure was a boat's width. A boat's width, about four feet. I mean, that's the difference, right, between success and failure. They, all night long they had toiled and just four feet away was a, a massive catch. And sometimes we need to realize this that sometimes we success is closer than we think and we tend to give up too easily but just four feet away from them was a was a great success and the lord knew that and so they caught this wonderful catch now does it all sound familiar to you these uh, these events does it not remind you of a chapter earlier in the gospel of luke chapter 5 where the lord had called them to be fishers of men. And if you remember Luke's gospel, chapter five, it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of almost an echo here. Uh, and let's just take the time just for a minute to read the first 11 verses of Luke five, uh, just to see this little echo uh, that's taking place. It says, it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed the great multitude of fish and their net break. And they beckoned to their partners, which were on the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished. And all that were with him at the draft of the fishes, which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto them, Simon, fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So this incident in John 21 is a stark reminder of the fact that the Lord had called them to leave fishing for fish and to follow him and to become fishers of men. And what he's doing, he's saying to them, yes, you've let me down. Yes, you failed but I'm not done with you. I still have a work for you to do. And so he's, he's bringing them to familiar ground. He's actually taking them back to where, in a sense, where it all began, uh, where their calling uh, to serve him began. And of course, we, we say this, there's nothing wrong with being a fisherman or earning your living in that manner or any other manner. But it's not, the, the point is, it's not our chief end, our chief purpose. The Lord has a more important work 
for all of us to do than even our secular employment. Now, I'm not saying we we shouldn't do that. Uh, in fact, there's great dignity in Scripture to work, and uh, Scripture affirms that. But it's not it's not what we're all about. We we work so we can be involved in the greater work, and the greater work is this. And he got it in this chapter. Two things that he brings out: fishing for men, evangelism, and then secondly, feeding and shepherding God's sheep. And these are the these are the primary purposes that God has called us to. And so it's, he's, he's letting them know, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a fisherman or earning your living in that manner, but it's not our chief end and purpose why we're left here on earth. The Lord has a work for us to do, and that is to be fishers of men and then to be shepherds of sheep. Now, it's interesting that fishers of, uh, of fish when they catch a fish, they catch them that are alive, and then they kill them. That's what fishes of fish do, right? But fishes of men, they catch fish, uh, as it were, that are dead, or men that are dead. And through the gospel, they make them alive. <laughs> and so it's kind of interesting, the little parallelism there, that in our ministry as fishes of men, we're, we're going after people who are dead in their trespasses and sins, and we have a message that can bring them alive and give them new life, just the very opposite of the regular aspect of fishing. Notice uh, again verse um, 6. <clears throat> it says, um, or verse 7, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. And so once again, we observe John is always, it seems, the first to understand. But Peter is the first to act. And so he says, it's the Lord. He, he recognizes this stranger on the shore is none other than the Lord. And then it says, now when Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, or he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. Again, no standing on ceremony. Uh, off he goes, uh, just as we would expect. This is his character through and through. Uh, decisive, impulsive, let's get it done. And so uh, he does this. Now, it's interesting, too, that he doesn't want to appear immodestly before the Lord, because they would have fished just in their loincloth. And so even though he's jumping into the sea, he gets his fisherman's cloak and puts it on. And maybe, again, there's a lesson for us in these casual days we find ourselves in that, um, uh, that not that we, I'm not saying we have to wear a black three-piece suit. That's, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But, and again, our midweek meetings, some of our brethren come straight from work. And I'm glad that they come straight from work. But they try to clean themselves up a bit, even coming straight from work. And so just this idea that Peter, it says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat on him, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. And so he attires himself with the best that he has available before going to meet the Lord. Verse 8, it says, And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And so, again, we want to just make a point here. He talked about the, the extent of the fish, and uh, it says in verse 6, they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. And so it was quite a, a, an arduous task to, to pull this net, and, and the disciples do it. But we're going to see later on, Peter's going to drag that net uh, over the seashore on his own. And so it tells us something of the physical immensity and strength of this man, Peter, uh, that he's able to do that. And uh, perhaps energized by seeing the Lord, uh, he's able to do this. Notice then, please, it says, verse 9, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon in bread. Now, <clears throat> Again, we, we, we've, we've mentioned this idea of the Lord taking them back to the beginning in Luke chapter 5. 
Now the fire of coals is going to take Peter back to that awful night that he denied the Lord. Because the last time we heard in Scripture of a fire of coals is in John 18 and verse 18. It says, And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And so as Peter drew near to this scene, no doubt seeing this fire of coals brought many memories flooding through his mind of that sorrowful night. Then, verse 10, Jesus saith to him, unto them, bring of the fish which thou hast not, have now caught, ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and three, for all that there were so many, yet was not the net broken. So again, Peter, incredible strength, he drags the net up to them and he says, we're told, John says, there were 153 fish and yet the net was not broken. Unlike the previous net that had broken because the Lord has said in Luke 5, let down the nets and they let down the net singular and uh, they the net broke. This time uh, they did exactly as the Lord told them to do. The net did not break. But also notice uh, it tells us there's 153 fish. And of course, a lot of discussion about what is the significance of the 153 fish and much speculation. Um, perhaps the main thing is that this was such a significant incident that John never forgot it, even down to the finest detail, that he could even remember how many fish were in that net, uh, that the mem- it was emblazoned on his memory. And, uh, and he, couldn't even, he, he couldn't forget any detail of that glorious morning. And so he tells us there are 153 fish. Now, one Jewish guide uh, in, the, in the land of Israel had made the statement that 153 different varieties of fish are flourishing in the Sea of Galilee. And uh, if that's correct, and again, I have no way of verifying that. I just heard that uh, from him. Uh, If that is the case, uh, the implication is that they would soon be catching all kinds of men, people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Uh, But again, we we don't have to speculate too much. We simply know this. John never forgot that morning. And Peter didn't either, by the way. He would refer to it uh, as well as a uh, a great event in his life. And so uh, he would mention it uh, in his sermon in Acts chapter 10. And so certainly uh, it's an amazing thing that uh, this would be the case. And so verse, uh, verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. Even though they brought this fish, it wasn't necessary because the Lord already had fish for them. He'd already prepared, uh, if you notice verse 9, as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. And so he comes and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. And I said, Peter never forgot this. If you look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 41, as he's preaching uh, to the house of Cornelius, he refers to this incident. And he says in Acts 10, 41, it says, Now to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. We did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And the implication is that the Lord also partook of the fish and bread that we ate with him. And... Uh, <clears throat> course, uh, Peter remembered this, and uh, it, it stood in his mind. Of course, he remembered it because it was the day that he was restored uh, to service and usefulness. Again, we're, we're reminded of another miracle of the Lord's provision, aren't we? Uh, here, he provides for them fish and bread, and he had done that 
in John's gospel, chapter six and verse 11, where he had provided fish and bread for the multitudes. Uh, John chapter six, verse 11. <laughs> and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And so again, just there's a lot of kind of reminders, reminiscences in these events that are taking place, things that would call them back to the wonderful three and a half years that they'd had with the Lord, how he had called them, how he had provided for them and for the multitudes. And then uh, how sadly, at least in Peter's case, he had let the Lord down uh, at that fire of coals. Notice John says this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. Now, we know it's not the third time that he had appeared uh, because uh, we'd already said on that first resurrection day, there were five appearances. And then there was a sixth uh, when he appeared to the group with Thomas um, on the following Lord's Day. And this is the seventh appearance. But it's the third time that he appears to the disciples as a group. And so that's what John is emphasizing. This is the third time he's appeared to them as a group. He appeared that first time when Thomas was absent, the second time when Thomas was present, and now to this group of seven, he appears to them again. And so he tells us this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples in the plural after that he was risen from the dead. And so with all this in the background, the fire of coals, the remarkable resemblance of the incident when he had called them to be fishers of men, all provide the perfect background for what is about to follow in verses 15 through 17. It says, when they had dined, and uh, by the way, Jesus had said in verse 12, and I meant, I don't want to overlook this, but he said, come and dine. There are three great invitations that he gives in John's gospel to his followers. He says in John 1 39, come and see when he, let's just look at it in context. John 1 39, just to remind ourselves of the, these three glorious invitations. John 1 uh, 30, uh, 39, uh, in answer to uh, verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, what seek ye? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, come and see. Isn't it interesting that very soon the Lord is going to do that with us. He's going to ask us to come and see where he dwells, the Father's house. And he's going to say, come and see. <laughs> and we're going to leave here very quickly in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We're going to come and see. We're going to go where he is uh, in his father's house. Come and see. And then in John 7, he says, come and drink. John 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And then the John 21, come and dine. Of course, dining speaks of fellowship, table fellowship. Uh, he wants us to see him in all his glory, that they may uh, see my glory. He wants us to see him. He wants us to drink of the spirit in all of its fullness in our lives. Of course, that's what he's referring to in John 7. And he wants us to enjoy unbroken fellowship with him. Come and dine. And isn't it wonderful that the Lord is the one who initiates this? He wants our fellowship. Uh, he wants us to enjoy his fullness. He wants us to see him in all his beauty. Such is our glorious Lord. So verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. Interesting that three times Peter had denied the Lord, 
and three times the Lord would ask Peter this vital question. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? It's interesting, too, that he uses the term, Simon, son of Jonah, the, the term that he used with Peter before he re renamed him. Again, he's taking him back. He's going back to the very beginning. And as it were, he is re, uh, it, re uh, commissioning Peter, but he's going back to the very beginning when he, when he first met him and he changed him from Simon, son of Jonah, and he called him Peter. But he goes back to his old name and he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And of course, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, the Greek here that uh, the Lord asks, in, at least in the first two, uh, he uses the word agape, do you, do you, using that specific Greek word. And uh, Peter doesn't respond that way. He uses phileo. And so uh, lots of discussion on this. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting because uh, sometimes uh, even the father speaks of the Lord Jesus uh, in terms of both agape and phileo. So it, it, uh, sometimes I think we make more out of it than necessary and uh, read more into it. Maybe it's just stylistic. I don't know. Uh, but certainly, uh, he, he says to Peter, do, do you really love me, Peter? And it's interesting how Peter, who had so vehemently uh, had said in the past that though all men uh, deny you, I will never deny you. And I really believe that that's what's going on here. The Lord is, is seeing if Peter's pride has died down any. Uh, is he still uh, as cocky as he once was? And so he, he says, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me more than these? Now, again, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of speculation about what does he mean by do you love me more than these? <clears throat> do you love me more than the fish? in the fishing business that you've gone back to so quickly, or perhaps more accurately, or maybe both are in view. I mean, how much do you love me, Peter? Uh, he goes back to perhaps Matthew 26 in verse 23, Matthew 26, verse 23, where we read this from Peter's lips where at the very least he's implying he does love the Lord more than everybody else. No, it's not 23, 33. Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And so in that statement, Peter is basically saying, that he, he did love the Lord more than everybody else. It, 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 no matter what anybody else does, Lord, they may let you down, but I will never let you down. You can depend on me. Uh, I'm, I'm Rocky. Remember that? You know, I'm that, I'm that Rocky guy. You can really depend on me, uh, he says, even though everybody else will be offended. I will never be offended. And so it implied in that statement that, he, that his undying love for the Lord uh, made him above the rest. And subsequent events had shown that he was no better than his peers. And, you know, sometimes the Lord allows things in our lives to show us that we're no better than anybody else. The best of men are men at best. And we all fail every one of us. And so it's good sometimes to learn that. It's a hard lesson to learn, but it's a good lesson to learn. And so the Lord says to Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter's reluctant. He says, you know, I'm fond of you. <laughs> I have affection for you. His pride and his self-confidence have certainly died down. And so he does say, I, I do have affection for you. And so the Lord says to him, well, feed my lambs. Isn't it good that Peter took seriously the Lord's commissions? He, he was an excellent fisher of men the day of Pentecost. He, he did some good fishing that day. 
He got a great haul of fish, 2,000, uh, 3,000 souls on that one day. And through the Acts, we see him being so effective uh, as a fisher of men. And then as we've seen in our study of First Peter, and First Peter chapter 5 particularly, he also took seriously feeding the lambs. And uh, he, he had that wonderful epistle that is so helpful to young, young Christians. And so to feed, supply the food for my lambs. He says again in verse 16, he says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He said to him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, feed my sheep. Again, he, he says, I, I do have affection for you. And so this time he says, feed or tend my sheep. All the care that shepherd gives to the sheep. You, you do this, Peter. You give yourself to the tending of the flock uh, that is so precious to me. In other words, what he's saying is, Peter, if you love me, I want you to love what I love. I love my sheep. You love them. I love these little lambs. You love them and you care for them. And again, isn't it true that um, the great motivation for any service for the Lord is love? He doesn't say, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love my sheep? He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And if you love me, you will love what I love and you'll care for what I love because I love them. I, I shed my precious blood for them. They are dear to me. You care for them because I love them. And again, even down to our obedience, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? And it all comes down to a love relationship with the Lord Jesus. It's not about performance. It's not about uh, earning favor. Uh, we do what we do because we're in love with the Lord Jesus. And why do we love him? Well, we love him because he first loved us. <laughs> That's why we love him. So the third time, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he could see now the connection. Three times he had denied him with oaths and cursings. Three times the Lord asked him, do you love me? But this time he says, do you feel at all me? Do you have affection for me, Peter? And Peter's very grieved. He says, you already know my heart. You know everything. You know that I have affection for you. And he says, once more, feed my dear sheep. So how do we conclude these uh, thoughts that we've considered this morning? Do we realize Firstly, that God has something more important to us than our careers. Although we, we can do that and we should do that to the glory of God, it's not our chief reason to exist. Why are we left here on the earth? Well, we're left here for a purpose. We're to be active in fishing for men and feeding sheep. <laughs> this is where the heart of the Lord is. And that's what he wants us to do, to make that our interest, to make, as it were, his interests, our interests. And then secondly, do we grasp the true motive for service? It's our love for the Lord Jesus. And the Lord is asking us this morning, and it's good to ask ourselves a question, as if the Lord was saying it directly to you, your name, do you love me? And if our response is, yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you, he would say to you, well, you love what I love. You care for what I care for. And then I, I suppose the most wonderful message really that comes through in all this, and it's a message of the Bible, and that is that failure need never be final. The Lord is in the reclamation business. I can't help but think of the book of Jonah in chapter 3, verse 1, where we read these words, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. What happened? The Lord recommissioned Jonah, didn't he? And now he says, as it were, the word of the Lord came to Simon, son of Jonah, the second time. And says, do you love me, Peter? I still have a work for you to do. And isn't it good that even 
if we do fail, it doesn't have to be final. And the law does still have a work for us to do. It might be different than what we initially anticipated or imagined, but he still has a work for us to do. And so the Lord Jesus publicly commissioned Simon, son of Jonah, the second time. Remember John Mark, another example of somebody who failed, and yet the Lord still had a purpose. I wonder if, other than the Lord Jesus, who was perfect in every way, I wonder if people who have never failed are perhaps unsuited, at least in their own minds, people who have never failed, are unsuited to caring for the flock of God because they lack compassion and are more prone to pride and self-righteousness than men who have discovered their own weakness. And let's not be too quick to write off another person who may have failed in some measure. Can God still use them? I do believe he can. Remember John Mark. Remember Simon, son of Jonah. Remember that failure does not have to be final. Remember that the Lord may get you up on your feet again and throw the towel back at you and say, I still want you to serve me, even though you feel that you've let me down. And so isn't it wonderful? This is the Lord who we serve. So worthy of our worship, so worthy of our adoration, so compassionate, so gracious in every way. May his name be praised. Amen.